Welcome Life Science Learners to another installment. I trust that you guys are well and you're going to interact today with us. We're looking at today the human reproductive system and we're going to spend some time looking at the male and female reproductive systems. This is an important topic as it leads to understanding how the process of reproduction takes place and hence it's important that we first look at the structure of the male and the female reproductive system. So let's get into the lesson and have an overview of the main concepts in this lesson. In our lesson today, we're going to spend some time looking at an overview of the male reproductive system, the parts and their structures and functions, and we will spend some time looking at the female reproductive systems. We will then move on to looking at the details of how the male reproductive system works and do that as well for the female reproductive system. As a reminder, as we start this lesson, it is important for us to be able to recognize that when we're looking at biological diagrams and concepts, it is important that when we look at, for example, the male reproductive system, we study from a diagram, that we're able to label the diagram, and that we're able to identify the functions. So the golden rule is learn a diagram, learn the labels, understand the structure, and explain their functions. So I'll kind of put that down so that you remember what this is and apply that to the context of whatever we're doing in life sciences. So the rule is learn a diagram of, and the diagram is the best way to learn a diagram is to actually draw a diagram. And so drawing is important in being able to help you remember. So draw the diagram, you will then provide labels for them, and then look at each label and look at the structure of that part and then try and understand how that part actually carries out its specific function. So in our next segment, we're going to look at structure and then we're going to follow that with looking at the details of each structure and their functions. So as we look at the male reproductive system, it is important that we understand what is the main components of the male reproductive system. So what does it consist of? So as we get into the section, we're going to look at the male reproductive system containing a pair of testes, it has a system of tubes that are essentially important for the transportation of sperms and certain secretions. We're also going to look at some glands that are associated with the male reproductive system, and we refer to them as the accessory glands, and we're going to look at the organ, the penis, which is used during copulation. Right, so as I mentioned, it is important that we have diagrams, and the simpler the diagram, the more convenient and easier it is to understand the structure. So I've put in a very schematic diagram so that it makes it easier for us to be able to identify parts. These diagrams often come in different views and so what we're looking at today is the front view of the male reproductive system. And as we look at this, it's important that we try and recognize firstly what are the parts and then we will look at the structure and their function. So let's look at just identifying the parts. So as I said, the male reproductive system consists of a pair of testes which we find located in a sac that extends below the lower abdomen and that is the scrotum. So we find that the testes are suspended in a sac and that's called the scrotum. We have a pair of the testes. These in turn produce secretions and sperms and they are transported via a tube called the sperm duct or in some textbooks, it's referred to as the vas deferens. So as you would see, you've got a tube on either end that transports the sperm from the point in which they're produced, which are here in the testes, to where they are going to be released into the tube called the urethra. So we have a common tube called the urethra that carries both secretions from the testes as well as urine from the bladder. So it's a common tube that carries both semen as well as urine. So that's the urethra. We also have on the surface of the testes a coil tube called the epididymis. And so if we look at both the testes, we see a coil tube on the surface of the testes. The structure and function of that would be discussed in detail as we move into the next part of it. We also know that they are accessory glands that are associated with the male reproductive system. And these are the prostate gland, the seminal vesicle, and we also have the culpus gland. 
And that unfortunately can only be seen in the side view. So the three glands that are important are the prostate gland, the seminal vesicles, as well as the Cowper's gland. And so we will look at those in, a, in detail in a bit. So that's an overview of that. What is important is that we're able to recognize that the penis is made up of a specialized tissue called erectile tissue. And this erectile tissue essentially fills up with blood upon stimulation and becomes erect. And we'll discuss what an erection is later on in the session. If we look at the female reproductive system, we can look at it and deconstruct it looking at the following structures. So we have a pair of ovaries, we've got the organs that are responsible for the transportation of the egg from the ovum into, from the egg from the ovary into the fallopian tube. And we also have the external genitalia, which is the vulva. A closer look at that in a diagram looks like this. So we, as I mentioned, we've got a pair of ovaries. We have a system of tubes called the fallopian tubes, which carry the eggs into a muscular organ called the uterus. Okay, so that's important for us to be able to recognize as we look at an overview. We also have the vagina through which copulation takes place. We have an opening between the uterus and the vagina called the cervix. And lining the uterus, we have a lining called the endometrium. We have finger-like projections at the ends of the fallopian tube called fimbriae. And so this is essentially what it looks like in the side view. So again, looking at those parts, we're able to identify the uterus as a muscular organ. We're able to see that just below the uterus, or in front of it, is the bladder. We have an opening called the urethra, which is different to the male reproductive system, which is a separate tube in the females. In the side view, we can see the fallopian tube and we can see the position of the ovaries. We also are able to identify the position of the vagina and the location of the cervix. So guys, we've looked at an overview of the male system and the female systems just to understand the parts. It is important that you're able to identify, firstly, the parts on a diagram. In our next segment, we're going to look at each structure, its adaptation for its function, and we'll discuss more details around how these parts work. Thank you for staying tuned. Have a little break, and we'll see you in a short while. Welcome back, life science learners. In this segment, we're going to look at the details of the male and female reproductive system. As I mentioned earlier on, when we're looking at reproductive organs, it's important in any context for us to understand structure, function, and then be able to explain the association of different parts. So that's exactly what we're going to do. So let's try and unpack what we've looked at in the first segment and now understand the details of each structure and their function. So we're going to focus again on the details of the male reproductive system and we're going to spend a lot of time doing, trying to understand how this actually works. So the male reproductive system contains the following structures that contribute to the production of sperm and semen and they are important in the reproductive processes in males. The following structures that we're going to discuss are organized according to the path taken by sperm from the production to the release. So, so essentially what we're going to look at is where sperms are produced and the pathway all the way through the male reproductive system until they are released. Now I think it's important so that we have an understanding to the journey of the sperm from where it's produced and even to the point at which when it is going to fertilize an egg. And that would be a continuation in terms of in the female reproductive system. So this gives you some direction as to where to start. So as I mentioned, we will start with the point at which the male reproductive cells are produced. So we know that, we, as I mentioned earlier on, we have a pair of testes 
And this diagram is a side view. And the reason I've chosen that is for us to be able to have a different context to how we see the male reproductive system. So on the side, we've got a pair of testes. And as I mentioned, they're situated in a sac called the scrotum that distends or hangs slowly, slow, uh, slightly below the body. And they are connected to um, the rest of the, the male reproductive system through a coiled tube called the epididymis. And so in this coiled tube, we find that the sperms spend some time actually maturing. They then travel up a tube called the vas deferens or the sperm duct. And that vas deferens is a tube that connects the testes to an area called the ejaculatory duct. And this is where the sperms are released into a tube called the urethra. So that is the tube that brings out the sperm along with the secretions from the glands during what we call an ejaculation. What is important also is for us to recognize that the urethra is a tube that also carries the urine and, and that urine is stored in the, the bladder. And so we see that the bladder is there. Further up here, we have the pair of kidneys that produce the urine and you would have looked at that during the process of excretion and then that urine is stored in the bladder. And we find that the urine and the semen are released through a common tube called the urethra. Not at the same time, but they are using a, 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 a common tube to be able to release the production that these two different parts have. Okay, so we've looked at the tubes from the testes all the way up. As I mentioned earlier on, there are glands that are associated with the male reproductive system that contribute to the production of sperm and semen. So these glands, as I mentioned, was the prostate gland, the cowper's gland, which I've called in this diagram the biliourethral gland, as well as we have the prostate gland. And so that prostate gland is situated right here. We also have a view of the proximity of the rectum and the anus. So it gives you an understanding as to where and how the body is situated. In the body, this is situated. We then look at the pubic bone, which is part of the pelvic girdle, and that's situated right in the front, and that's a section that we have through this pubic bone. Let's look at each part and try and understand, as I mentioned, its structure and its function. So when looking at the testes, we know that they are responsible for the production of sperm and an important hormone called testosterone. And testosterone is the male sex hormone that is produced that ensures that we have secondary sexual characteristics. And that's something that we're going to look at in terms of puberty and what, are the, what is the impact of testosterone on the growth of a boy into a man. Okay, so in this diagram we can see here, that's the testes and they're situated in a sac slightly below the body um, in a sac called the scrotum. On closer view, we can take a section through the testes and we can look at that in detail. And this shows you a longitudinal section through the testes. And within that, we see several coils of tubes called the seminiferous tubules. And it is within these tubules that we look at that we see the development of sperm taking place or spermatogenesis. On the surface of the testes, as I mentioned, are the coil tubes. And you see that here, and that's the epididymis. And they connect to the vast deference that then carries out the sperm to the ejaculatory duct. So again, in a longitudinal section, we can see that there are several tubes highly coiled and convoluted within the testes that produce the sperm cells. On closer inspection, I've taken this and I've cut a section through those tubes and that is what I've illustrated here. So each of these tubes have been cut open and that's what I've illustrated here. So we're looking at a cross section through each of these seminiferous tubules. And if we have a closer look at that, and that's one seminiferous tubule that's cut in a cross section, we can see that it contains several layers of cells. And these cells undergo a process of cell division, which we're going to discuss, called gametogenesis, to produce these young developing sperm cells. And if you look closer on here, we can see towards the middle, we've got these cells developing. We also know that the seminiferous tubules, 
play an important role in the production of sperm as well as the development of the sperm. Between the seminiferous tubules, if you look at this space here, we've got cells called interstitial cells or your Leydig cells. And it is in these cells between the seminiferous tubules that we have testosterone being produced. So testosterone as a hormone is being produced in these cells here. And those cells will then release the testosterone that enter the seminiferous tubules and stimulate the further development of these sperm cells. Okay, and we see a closer view of these interstitial cells here. What is also important for us to recognize is that in the seminiferous tubules, there are cells that are playing a very important role in the maturation and the development of the sperms. And those cells are called the Sertoli cells. And those Sertoli cells are essentially the nursing cells that help mature and nourish the young developing sperms within the seminiferous tubules. And so if you look at this space here, here we're seeing a cell that's responsible for the development and the maturation of sperm. As I mentioned, the coil tube on the surface of the testes here, called the epididymis, this is a site where the sperms mature. They develop the ability to become motile, which means that is where they mature and the tail develops so that they're able to swim and move through the vas deferens. Okay, so this is an important area where the sperms actually develop and are stored until ejaculation. What's also important to realize is that what happens if ejaculation does not happen? Or what happens if sperms are not released? So those sperms have a lifespan after which they will gradually be degenerated and then used to sustain and to supply the nourishment for the other developing sperms. So sperms will eventually, upon maturation, remain in the, in the epididymis and then be gradually broken down so that they can sustain and feed off other developing sperms. The vas deferens, or the sperm duct, is a long tube, and we see that here, that connects the epididymis to the point where the sperm is released. And so those long tubes conduct the sperm from the testes to the prostate gland, which connects to the urethra. And that is, there's an ejaculatory duct here, which allows for the sperm, along with the secretions from the accessory glands, to mix together to form semen. And that is where that process of ejaculation um, takes place. Okay. Upon further looking into the male reproductive system, we know that there are glands that are associated with the male reproductive system. And we looked at these. These are your seminal vesicles, and here they are. We've got a pair of them. We also discussed the prostate gland, which is this gland situated slightly below the, the bladder. So let's look at the seminal vesicles. So these secrete a secretion that contains fructose. And if you think of fructose, it's a sugar, it's a type of carbohydrate that's important that provides the nourishment for these young developing sperms to be able to get the energy they need so that they can swim and travel. So that's there again to nourish them. The seminal vesicle also produces a secretion which is a mucus. And that mucus basically allows for the sperms to be able to survive the acidity as they pass through the urethra as well as up into the vagina. Remember that the urethra is a tube that releases urine as well. So this is very acidic. And hence, many of the sperm cells are destroyed because of the hostile, acidic environment. So having the secretions from these prostate glands, as well as the seminal vesicles, allow for the sperms to be able to survive more effectively. Okay. When we look at the prostate gland, this secretes an alkaline fluid. And this, as I mentioned, is important in neutralizing the vaginal acid, which obviously is, 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 what going, is what's going to destroy some of the sperm cells. So the prostate gland has an alkaline secretion. So think of the alkaline secretion and think of the acidic nature of the urethra firstly, as well as the vaginal tract. So these areas are highly acidic because of urine. And so we need to have some kind of alkaline medium to neutralize the acidity. And we know that acidity affects or alkalinity can affect the survival of these sperms. So that is one mechanism that ensures that the sperm cells survive. 
Cool. We also con con mentioned the urethra, which is a tube that connects the bladder and carries out both semen and sperm. So this basically conducts sperm and semen from the prostate gland all the way to the rest of the body. Okay. Some important terms for us to be able to discuss. What is an erection? An erection basically is the hardening of the penis that occurs when, a, when the sponge-like tissue inside fills up with blood. Okay? Another important term is semen. And semen essentially is a mixture of sperm with the secretions from the prostate gland and the seminal vesicles. And these ensure that the sperm cells survive and are able to travel in that medium from the male reproductive system into the vaginal tract. Okay, so sperm, as we discussed, is a male reproductive cell, and that is produced during gametogenesis, and it's called a gamete. Okay, the release of semen along with sperm cells during copulation is called ejaculation. So when the male reproductive system releases semen, that process is called ejaculation. The following parts are in the female reproductive system. And so we're going to try and wrap this section up by looking at the female reproductive system. As I mentioned, these structures are also organized by the path in which the eggs travel from the point of production, which is from the ovaries all the way down to the cervix. So let's try and unpack that as we discuss these. So as I mentioned, the ovaries, we have a pair of them, and these are important in two things. They produce the eggs or the ova, as well as the production of estrogen and progesterone. And so these are the female reproductive hormones that are, in, that are responsible for maintaining the female reproductive system, as well as changes in the body during puberty. We're also going to look at these structures called fimbriae, which are the ends of the fallopian tubes, which basically act as fingers that sweep and pull in the egg when they are released during ovulation from the ovary. These will then travel via what we call the oviducts or the fallopian tubes, which are extremely narrow tubes, which have finger-like projections or hair-like cilia that allow them to sweep the egg along. And so that egg travels along until it gets into this muscular organ called the uterus. And the uterus is this muscular organ that has the lining called the endometrium. As I mentioned, the endometrium is the inner lining that is prepared in anticipation of an egg being fertilized. And finally, we have the, male, the female reproductive organ, which is used during copulation, and that is the vagina. So it's a muscular organ during, which, uh, during sexual intercourse, during which the penis is inserted. And so we find that during sexual intercourse, the penis is inserted and semen is released and that is able to travel up the cervix. Well guys, that's a wrap of this segment. You've been focused, you deserve a little break, so freshen up and I'll see you at the end of the break. Welcome back, life science learners, to another segment. In this segment, we're going to look at the structure of the female reproductive systems and what happens to them during puberty. We're also going to look at puberty in males. Let's look at the concepts in this lesson. So let's look at puberty and what happens during puberty. And then we're going to move on to looking at gametogenesis and the process of the production of the male gametes and the female gametes. So it's important that we understand what is puberty. And often in grade eight and nine, we go through a process of teachers explaining to us changes in our body. And so those changes are often changes that we find difficult to understand at that age. But I suppose when you start understanding the body and understanding what happens, you can understand the process better. So essentially puberty is a process of changes physically and emotionally. Of in the body that prepares a young individual to become sexually reproductively 
capable. Now, what does that mean? So if you think of every individual, when we're born, we're born with male and female parts. However, as a young boy that's not reached puberty or a girl, we're not able to produce offspring. So it means that there are lots of changes that need to happen to the body in order for a child to be able to mature to produce an offspring. So those changes that happens to the body that allows for an individual, a boy or a girl, to be able to reproduce is referred to as puberty. And so this does not just affect the physical changes, but as well in terms of emotional changes. So it's a difficult phase for some individuals. There are lots of hormones that are involved. And so those hormones bring about emotions that are very different to the way you would have felt before all of these changes. You become very self-conscious because there are things that change in your body. Individuals tend to gain weight. Sometimes body changes. And so those changes often are not understood well. So let's look at what happens during puberty. Let's try and have an insight as to why it happens. Okay, so as I mentioned, it's a physical change as well as mentally that a child's body goes through into becoming capable of sexual reproduction. These changes include changes in hormones as well as your emotional changes that take place. Let's look at puberty in males. And so we refer to these as changes in secondary sexual characteristics and hormones. So what do I mean by secondary sexual characteristics? These are the changes that happen at puberty to the body. And so let's look at what that means. So we often hear of someone changing and becoming from a boy into a man. So we know that there are changes in the body. Let's try and unpack that. So we know that testosterone plays an important role. We discuss that it's produced by the testes, but this happens at a specific age. And this causes the prenatal development of the male genitalia, as well as the development of the male secondary sexual characteristics during puberty and controls sperm production for the rest of their lives. So, so during the development of a baby in the fetus, we find that the testosterone levels will, in, will, will kind of influence the development of the male reproductive system. But at puberty, we find that the development allows, the testosterone allows for the development of the male parts as well as for the production of sperm. So when we look at the male reproductive system and puberty in males, these are some of the characteristics that we see due to the increase in hormones. So we find that the testes will start producing sperms, and that is because of the influence of the hormone testosterone. And so testosterone is produced by cells in the testes that are then released that stimulate the production of testosterone. We know that there's an emotional change, an impact on the brain. So there's an increased drive for sexual activity. We know that sometimes the voice of boys become deeper, and that again is the growth of the larynx, the voice box. We see there's an increase in facial hair as well as body hair. Boys tend to develop rapid muscle at, a puberty, at an age of puberty. We also know that there's the development of the external male genitalia, so the development of the testes and the penis, and these become significantly larger. So we often see changes in boys around the age of 13 and 14, and this is very different in, in different boys. So there's no specific age where all boys that are 13 or 14 start undergoing puberty. That's a general age around which this happens. It could happen in some boys much earlier, in others slightly late. But this is again influenced by environment and one's individual development. When we look at testosterone in the male reproductive system, as I mentioned, it is secreted by the testes and it's responsible for, again, the development of the male reproductive glands, in, in this case the, the penis as well as the testes. It stimulates the onset of puberty and testosterone aids in the development of the male characteristics such as the development of muscle mass, hair on the body, the deepening of the voice, etc. It also helps to maintain male sex drive. And so that is an important hormone in males. Puberty in females, also influenced by hormones, also bring about changes in the body. And we refer to those changes at puberty as secondary sexual characteristics. 
The two main hormones that are responsible for these changes are estrogen and progesterone. And so these are important in female reproductive system as well as in controlling the menstrual cycle. So we know that these hormones play an important role in the process of menstruation. But before that happens, there's an increase in estrogen and progesterone that stimulates the development of the ovary and the, the further development and production of eggs in the ovary. We will also see changes in the female body. What has been seen is that there is a significantly younger age at which girls go through puberty when compared to males. And that's just how it is. And this has got to do with the development of the female body as well as the release of hormones, being at an age slightly younger than boys. So, when we look at the female reproductive system, we see that when puberty takes place, the development of these secondary sexual characteristics include the development, enlargement of the breast. We see that the, the hips often widen and there's an increase in fat deposition. The growth of body hair around the armpits and the pubic regions as well as the development of the female external genitalia. We also know that within the ovaries, we see a process of the egg development taking place, and all of this is regarded as changes in the body that happen as secondary sexual characteristics. So guys, you've done well. We've looked at the male reproductive system. We've looked at the parts that are responsible for changes during sexual uh, development at puberty, and we've compared those to the female reproductive system and how those structures and parts change during puberty. You've done well, you deserve a break, a quick short break and I'll see you at the end of that. Welcome back, life science learners. In this segment, we're going to focus on gametogenesis. Before we look at gametogenesis, a recap of what puberty was. So puberty was changes in the body that prepare the body for sexual reproduction. In males, it stimulates the production of sperm and testosterone. In females, we're looking at the production of eggs or ova, as well as the female reproductive hormones, estrogen and progesterone. Having, having said that, let's try and now understand what is the process of gametogenesis. And so if we break up the term gametogenesis, it's essentially the formation of gametes or genesis of gametes. So let's go back to a section that we've done at some point, which was meiosis. If we recollect, meiosis was a type of cell division that was important in the production of gametes. So if we were to try and understand what gametogenesis is, we've got to recollect that gametogenesis is a type of meiosis. Yes, guys, meiosis. And if we broke that up, meiosis happening in the female reproductive system and, me and meiosis happening in the male reproductive system. And both of these processes produce gametes. And hence, we refer to this process as gametogenesis, the production of gametes. So let's, as I kind of encapsulated that, we said that gametogenesis is the production of sperms through a process called spermatogenesis, along with the production of eggs or ova through a process called oogenesis. Okay, and both of these are processes which rely on meiosis or meiotic cell division. It's important that we understand the structure of the egg and the sperm so that when we talk of gametogenesis, we know what these processes produce. So when we compare the human egg to the human male sperm, we know that each of these structures are highly specialized structures. So it's important that we try and unpack, firstly, the structure of the male and female cells. So the male and female reproductive system produces gametes called sperms and ova, and these are specialized for the functions. The functions of being able to fertilize and produce a zygote. So the male gamete is small, motile, and only contributes to the male haploid nucleus to the zygote. And I'll unpack that in a little while. The female gamete, called the ovum, is large 
and non-motor and contributes to the organelles and the cytoplasm of the zygote. Now let's pause at that point. As I mentioned, that the sperm is probably one of the smallest cells in the body. It has a highly specialized structure, and we'll look at that in a bit. But that contributes again to half of the genetic information in the zygote. The other half of the genetic information comes from the egg. And the egg is a larger cell, which is non-motile, meaning it does not move. Yes, it does travel from the ovary, but that's, as I mentioned, it's through the movement of the fimbriae, pulling the egg into the fallopian tube, but also the cilia that sweep that through the fallopian tube. So the egg is a larger cell, non-motile, but that has also a significant contribution of half of the genetic material to the final zygote when fertilization takes place. So, when we look at the structure of a typical male sperm cell, we know that it consists of different regions. Let's try and understand those regions. It can be divided into the head, the midpiece, and the tail. So, the head, midpiece, and tail are just three regions that we can look at structurally. Okay. So, when we look at the head, the head consists of the haploid nucleus. The term haploid refers to having half the genetic information. And if you recollect from meiosis, haploid essentially means it's half the genetic information that goes to the zygote. It also has the paternal DNA, meaning that the sperm cell has the genetic information from the father's genetic nucleus. So half of that information in the zygote comes from the dad, and hence we say that's the paternal genetic information. Okay. The head also has a acrosome cap. So when we look at the head, it, it has a little vesicle called the acrosome. And this acrosome contains enzymes which allow the sperms to penetrate the outer jelly coat of an ovum. So this is an important structure or vesicle that produces an enzyme which allows the sperm to penetrate into the egg. When we look at the midpiece, the midpiece is a piece that contains several mitochondria. And this mitochondria are these mitochondria are important in producing what we refer to as energy for this sperm to be able to swim. And that energy is produced by the process of cellular respiration by the mitochondria in the midpiece. We also see a long tail of flagellum that has lots of contractile filaments that allow for the propulsion of the sperm as it moves from the point of ejaculation up into the uterine chamber. Let's look at the, a typical ovum. So an ovum is surrounded by two distinct layers, and we refer to those layers, as you'll see in the diagram, a, follic a layer of follicular cells, and that provides support and nourishment to the egg. It also has a jelly layer which becomes impenetrable once the sperm has penetrated, thus preventing other sperms from entering. So we find a layer on the outside of follicular cells, and you can see these cells on the outside that form a layer of follicular cells that have a very protective function. And then on the inner side of this, we have a jelly-like layer, which is what we refer to as the cytoplasmic internal contents. We also know that the egg contributes to the haploid genetic information from the mother, which we say is the maternal genetic information, which is haploid. And that comes from the mother's side. And so we find that when a sperm cell penetrates the layer of follicular cells, these corticular granules will secrete an enzyme that makes this membrane impenetrable to other sperm cells. So essentially, the structure of the egg is highly complex. It allows for only one sperm to enter and to release the genetic information. Once that happens, we find that the egg then releases a secretion that makes that outer covering impermeable to other sperms. And we find that only a single sperm cell is able to successfully fertilize the egg. Cool. So as I mentioned, it's good for us to be able to compare the structures of both. And if you look at them, we mentioned that the human egg is a non-motile structure. 
It's large, significant to the sperm cell. This sperm cell is drawn significantly bigger than it normally is. They're significantly smaller in comparison to the egg. Again, a long flagellum that allows them to be able to swim and travel all the way till they can meet an egg and fertilize that. Now let's look at the process of gametogenesis, having understood the structure of the egg and the sperm. So gametogenesis is a process by which the diploid germinal cell undergoes meiotic division to become haploid gametes. So essentially what we're saying is that a germinal cell is 2N, that will divide to produce what we call haploid cells. And these would be your gametes. And so essentially we've got to look at how these gametes are produced and that process is called gametogenesis. So in males, this process we mentioned earlier on is called spermatogenesis and they produce sperm cells which are called spermatozoa. It's important that we recognize that spermatozoa are young, immature sperm cells that gradually mature. They even mature and grow and become specialized in the epididymis, as we mentioned earlier on. In females, this process of gametogenesis is called oogenesis, and they produce ova, and sometimes we refer to that as the egg cells. The process of gametogenesis occurs in the organs called the gonads, and in the males, those are the testes, and in females, we refer to the ovaries in which gametogenesis occurs. Okay, so two meiotic cell divisions occur, that is meiosis 1 and meiosis 2, to produce the haploid daughter cells. And so these daughter cells then undergo a process of differentiation to become what we refer to as functional gametes. Let's try and look at that in a bit more detail for the sperm cells. During spermatogenesis, we know that the spermatozoa will develop inside the seminiferous tubules in the testes. So within the testes, if we take a longitudinal section through that, we see these highly coiled tubes. We've looked at a diagram having a cross section of these. Within these cross section seminiferous tubules, we see that the germinal epithelial developing and producing these young immature sperm cells. So this process again happens at puberty and it occurs when the germinal epithelial lining these seminiferous tubules undergoes meiosis. So here's a schematic representation of the process of spermatogenesis. So lining the seminiferous tubules, we have these cells called young spermatogonia that undergo specialization and development to form what we refer to as the primary spermatocytes. During meiosis one, these primary spermatocytes divide and become two haploid spermatocytes. And these are the secondary spermatocytes. What is important to note is that we now seeing that these cells from a haploid from a diploid nucleus, guys, become now haploid. So we see that there is a reduction in the chromosome number during first meiotic division. Each of these secondary spermatocytes then go on to completing second meiotic division to form four haploid spermatids. These further then undergo differentiation and maturation to become young sperm cells. And this again is a schematic representation of spermatogenesis. I'd like to move on to oogenesis. And so the word oogenesis refers to the production of the female gamete or ova within the ovaries. So guys, this image is an illustration of a section through the ovary. It shows you the different stages of the young follicle cells developing to become the mature follicle and then the process of an, an oocyte being released. And so that process we know is called ovulation. And then we see the development of this within the ovary. Let's try and understand this process in detail. So each month, the hormones, follicle stimulating hormone or FSH, stimulates the development of the follicles in the ovary. One cell in the follicle undergoes meiosis, producing four haploid cells. What is important for us to understand is that females during their monthly cycle produce a single dominant egg. 
And so they, unlike in males where millions of sperms are produced on a daily basis, there's a process in the female reproductive system where a single egg is produced over the cycle. One of these egg cells develop at the end of that cycle to form a mature egg, which we see released during ovulation. The other three cells shrink and are visible as polar bodies. So we find that a mature egg cell is released and the others eventually shrink and degenerate. Let's try and unpack that in this next process. So the primary oocyte remains arrested in prophase one, that's essentially during meiosis, until puberty. And then when a girl begins the process of menstruation, we see that each month with the assistance of the hormone FSH, this will trigger and continue the division of this cell that is arrested in prophase one. So these cells which stop dividing in prophase one at puberty, a single one cell, a cell will then undergo the further development and specialization under the influence of the hormone FSH. And so we see that follicle developing further. And so essentially, if we compare the two processes, we can see that the primary oocyte undergoes first meiotic division to form the secondary oocyte. That secondary oocyte at puberty is further stimulated to undergo second meiotic division to form a dominant ovum with three other polar bodies. And these polar bodies gradually degenerate to become insignificant. We find that there's a dominant egg which is released during ovulation. And I'll go back to this image here where we see that that dominant follicle releases an egg and we see a single egg being produced. So guys, that's a wrap of this segment. We've looked at the process of gametogenesis in males where four sperms are produced from a single germinal epithelial cell and this constantly happens through the influence of the hormone testosterone and it happens after puberty. We've compared that to the de development of eggs in a female. Again, we said that this also happens at puberty where a single egg which had developed in the uterus of the mother stops its development and waits until puberty. That egg then further continues its development in the ovary and one of these develops releasing a mature oocyte or secondary oocyte at ovulation and this cyclic happens because of the hormones FSH which stimulate the development as well as LH which we will discuss at some point again. So guys you've done well, you've been focused, hope you've enjoyed the lesson and I'm looking forward to greater engagement with you guys. All the best, have a bio lecker day and see you sometime soon. Mm -hmm.